Welcome to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. I'm your producer, Nika Larian. 30 to 40% of the food that is produced is either lost or wasted, contributing to a global food crisis with over 800 million going to bed hungry. Listen on as USAID experts speak with researchers and development professionals to explore solutions to this critical issue that demands a kitchen sink approach. When it comes to climate, food security, and food system sustainability, we have no time to waste. Thanks for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink, a food loss and waste podcast. My name is Nika Larian, producer of the Kitchen Sink and activity manager for Eat Safe a USAID-funded food safety program. The intersection between food safety, nutrition, and food loss and waste is significant, as spoiled or contaminated food must be immediately thrown away or composted. Most nutrient-rich foods, like produce, grain, and animal source foods, are highly susceptible to contamination. Contamination, either bacterial or chemical, can lead to chronic and acute health conditions, particularly for young children. Given the majority of people in low and middle income countries source food from traditional markets, these environments are a natural control point for foodborne disease, which has a similar impact to the big three, malaria, AIDS, and tuberculosis. As we celebrate World Food Safety Day 2023, it's important to highlight this year's theme, food standards save lives. This theme emphasizes the critical importance of food safety standards in protecting consumers from contaminated or spoiled food. The USAID-funded Feed the Future program, Eat Safe, Evidence and Action Towards Safe Nutritious Food, operates in Nigeria and Ethiopia and aims to increase consumer demand for safer food in traditional markets, where millions of people buy and sell food every day. Progress in food safety efforts, such as utilizing best practices to increase food safety, can simultaneously decrease food waste and loss generated in local markets. As a part of Eat Safe's programmatic design, uncovering stories from people living in and around the markets is essential. Eat Safe discovered these stories, which cross borders between food safety, loss, and waste through a technique called story sourcing. These stories shine a light on nuances of the community and the relationship to the market that more formalized data collections may miss. Today, you'll hear one of the many stories found through story sourcing. This dramatic vignette highlights the dangers of consuming contaminated food and the critical role that food safety standards play in protecting public health. Join as we delve into this compelling story and its implications for food safety and food loss and waste around the world. Welcome to the Starlight Hotel. We are delighted you're here with us. Here is your key, room 402. If you need anything, please don't hesitate to ask. Please watch the front desk. I'll be right back. Chef, we have a big group here tomorrow morning. Did you get more eggs? We have over 1,000 now, so we will be good. Excellent. Boo! Eggs coming out. Mm, Excuse me, would you bring me some more coffee? Oof, does something smell funny to you? Do you smell that? This egg smell like fuel. Excuse me. Hey, excuse me. Yes? Can I help you? How can you save this? Excuse me? There is something horribly wrong with the eggs. What do you mean? Smell them. Oh my. He smelled the same way. I hope we haven't been food poisoned. Please, I will be back in a moment. I was not even expecting that. Oh my god, I'm going to be sick. Chef, what is going on? Stop cooking immediately. Smell this. What's in the... Do you want to poison our customers? How did this happen? It smells like gas. 
I think it's kerosene. I don't care what it is. It shouldn't be in the eggs. How on earth did kerosene get in the eggs? What happened when you bought the eggs? Nothing. I just bought them. Awful. Smell this. Oh my, I didn't notice. How on earth did you all not smell this before you served it to the customers? How did you buy these? I am sorry, I don't smell the eggs when I buy them at the market. Where did you get these? At the main market? I was visiting my mom last night and got them at her local market on the way into town. Were they selling kerosene as well? Yeah, half the market there is kerosene and lamps. This is completely unacceptable. You don't see what happened, eh? The vendors clearly were battering kerosene for eggs and probably transporting them together. That's how kerosene got on these eggs. You can't buy food that sits next to chemicals. How many eggs? I bought a thousand. Hey! Oh my, my, my. We have to throw away one thousand eggs? Oh, oh, oh my. Oh my, le, le, le. To further dissect the story, I'm joined now by Walker Lambert, managing producer at Pierce Mill Media, one of the partners in Eat Safe's consortium. Thanks for joining us, Walker. This story highlights the delicate balance between food safety and food loss and waste, particularly in nutritious foods like eggs. I'm curious how this particular situation was resolved, and could you speak more broadly about the use of stories to help uncover problems and solutions for food waste and food safety? Thanks, Nika. Um, let's see, wherever we are working, um, we typically start with sourcing stories from the audience of people that we're working with. And by doing this, we can see a fuller picture of life in the community, particularly vis-a-vis -vis, um, how people are responding to a given subject. And in this case, obviously, that is food loss, waste, and food safety. Um, and this using these stories gives us kind of a more nuanced picture. And that nuanced picture allows us to design programs that really cue off the community's voice and the tensions between what people often do and what the program is aiming to impact. So uh, the egg story is, you know, one of the stories that, um, that we sourced. And uh, in this case, the actual resolution um, is not really a practice that we wanted to kind of push forward, but they, they tried to wash the remaining eggs to rid them of the chemical smell. Whether or not they actually ridded the chemicals from kind of the body of the egg itself is, is up for debate. But for them, throwing away that many eggs was simply not an option. It just wasn't going to fly. Um, but that gives a real world example of this tension between food safety, food law, food waste, you know, and just, you know, kind of basic economics of this small hotel. So in this case, what we really want to do is encourage the vendors and train the vendors to know from the outset that, you know, storing food, especially food like even foods like eggs, you know, covered foods, eggs, bananas, this kind of thing, next to chemicals is just a big problem for food safety. And if it's a big problem for food safety, it also becomes a big problem quickly thereafter uh, for food waste. Thanks for that response, Walker. I know I, I call Eat Safe a knowledge management powerhouse. They've done some really excellent formative research and, and that story sourcing has been really key. And as you said, really gets at the tension between food safety and a lot of the other areas that we're interested in, like food loss and waste. So on that note, um, I, I know that Eat Safe has a lot of excellent formative research and has led to the development of some great social and behavior change communication interventions in Nigeria and Ethiopia, soon to be Ethiopia, to help understand and improve food safety in traditional fresh food markets. So can you share how these traditional markets can reduce food loss and waste while still maintaining food safety? Sure. So let's see. Let's uh, let's start. Let's see. Um, we know what is needed to keep food from becoming contaminated and, and thereby wasted, more or less, at traditional markets. Um, we need clean water. We need proper handling. We need good waste management. There should be pavement, shade. Um, 
uh, elevated market stands so the food is off the ground, cold storage when that's possible. So all of these things, these, these infrastructure things and these practices keep food safer longer. And as a result, it prevents loss and waste, not to mention the benefit for public health, because obviously the food, you know, safe food is what you want. So market and infrastructure upgrades are great um, when there is money and when there is social and political will for them, which is not always a given um, for a variety of reasons. But of course, as we all know, that it, many traditional markets around the world, and certainly the ones that we're working at, uh, as part of this project, these kinds of infrastructure upgrades are, or even these kinds of infrastructure, um, this kind of infrastructure even being present is far, far from given, um, and it's often lacking. So in these situations, one of the most cost-effective approaches is to try to influence the behavior in and around the mar market, both the behavior of the vendor, but also the purchasing behavior of the consumer. Um, if the consumer is seeking out not merely the lowest cost item, but is looking for the best value item, which also includes, you know, safer food, of course, then we can, you know, have a win-win. Um, and so we're looking for ways to uh, create safer food options without necessarily increasing the price of the food being sold. And so some of the more straightforward things that can be done um, include covering the food to prevent flies or other environmental contem uh, chemical contamination, um, keeping the clean, uh, keeping a stall clean, uh, clean clothes, clean hands, clean utensils, general cleanliness to the extent um, possible around the stall, and then separating raw food from cooked food, and then cleaned food from unclean food. Um, and these are practices that vendors can usually, I say usually because um, not always, but can usually implement without massive infrastructure changes. And the consumers can see as they shop. And it's these visual cues, which are super important as part of a behavior change campaign, because the consumer obviously cannot test the quality of the food or the contamination levels of the food, but they can see these visual cues from the vendors. Um, and that's kind of a big piece of the puzzle. Now, of course, there's not one solution for food safety or for preventing the food from becoming waste. It will really take kind of a phase shift and lots of different uh, practices and techniques to kind of shift how people think about food safety and waste. But the fact remains that food, contaminated food is simply not food. It's already waste. So if the food is contaminated, it, is, it already is waste. It doesn't provide nutrients. And in fact, it does just the opposite of providing nutrients. You know, it often can poison you um, with uh, various foodborne diseases. Um, and it really, at that juncture, it needs to be tossed. So it's kind of a balance ensuring that food is safe and at the same time not wasted. But it starts with understanding that contaminated food is not food. Um, and so that's kind of what we're aiming to prevent from happening uh, in the markets who are working. One of our favorite slogans in the food safety division is safe food is saved food. So thank you for for belaboring that point because it's certainly an important one. And and thank you for joining this episode today. I really enjoy the the unique format that you've enabled us to explore on this particular episode. I think Eat Safe does a really great job of contextualizing traditional markets and how vendors and consumers are interacting in that space and the decisions they're making apropos to food safety and food loss and waste. So this gives us a great snapshot of what's really happening on the ground. So thank you, Walker, and, and thank you to the continued great work that Eat Safe is producing. And thank you. Thank you, Nika, for the opportunity to chat on, on this on this podcast. Thank you. Thank you for tuning in to USAID's Kitchen Sink. This podcast was produced by Nika Larian and is organized by the USAID Food Loss and Waste Community of Practice co-chairs, Ahmed Kablan and Anne Vaughn. Additional thanks goes to Feed the Future, the US government's global food security initiative and the USAID Center for Nutrition.